بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We carry on with tafsir of Surah Al-Anfal the eighth Surah of Quran Anfal the spoils Yes, we reached to Ayah 40 or 39 or 40 last time but I'll go quickly over the first 40 ayahs and then we carry on inshallah the surah was revealed immediately after the battle of Badr, the first battle between the Muslims and the Meccans. Actually, the first battle between the Muslims as a group, not as individuals, and the Kafirs. We said that battle of Badr became a landmark in Islam, in human history, that it changed the concepts of war, it changed the rules of engagement between Muslims and non-Muslims till the day of judgment because of Allah's direct interference, arranging things for Muslims, facilitating their victory, supporting them. And when Allah is on your side, no one can defeat you. So that's what the Muslims have learned and the Kafirs keep denying it. But every now and then they get surprised how fewer people, Muslims, fewer in number, in equipments, in logistics, in technology, and they still defeat them. It's like Taliban now in Afghanistan. Yes, Taliban much. is the latest example. Yes, and there has been there been the Mujahideen before that who the same yeah. people who defeated yeah. the Soviet Union. Um, Israel couldn't defeat Hamas, and that is just defeating a large prison, really, with two million prisoners in it in Gaza. Yes. And the examples from the Badr, from the Battle of Badr till now, hundreds, if not thousands. We did a lot of Islamic history in the past, and we saw that always the Muslims, almost in every battle, they are outnumbered, uh, and they still won in a miraculous way. So let's go quickly over the source. What happened that the Muslims had their first battle and they had spoils. The Meccans were 1,000 plus and the Muslims were 317 men, 313 men or 17, 313 men. Yeah. Uh, so they left behind their horses, their weapons, their food, uh, their shields. They left quite a few things with them their camels. So the Muslims started collecting them and the Muslims we said divided into three groups. One group uh, went to protect the Prophet ﷺ just in case the Kafirs could plan to attack him because he was alone with Abu Bakr, if you remember, before, uh, before the battle started. One group pursued the fleeing Meccans and one group were collecting from the battlefield, whatever they collected from the spoils. And then they were disputing who's the, uh, who should take what. But those who collected, they thought it was theirs and the others had good excuses. And they were disagreeing and shouting and then Allah revealed this surah by saying, they ask you about this the, or concerning the spoils, say this belong, it belongs to Allah and his messenger. Belong to Allah as the messenger means Allah and his messengers make uh, the decision for it. So fear Allah and make it make up your differences. So Allah took it all from them and he left it to himself and his messenger to decide. When Allah said Allah and his messenger, of course Allah does have, has no use of the spoils. Right? And but it's Allah who decides. That means you cannot go and claim, I have, I own this, right? Because this verse or ayah comes again now in the second part of the surah. Allah tells us in the surah as well about the believers, who are the believers, those so that when they hear the name of Allah, is, uh, uh, when they hear the name of Allah or the ayahs of Allah, the, the, uh, the Quran, they hear it, their hearts 
tremble, they fear piety in, the, in, the, in themselves, they keep the salah as well, it's not only feelings. And then the surah carries on about again how Allah helped the Muslims. He, showed, he gave us a few examples. One of them is before the battle started, he made them feel drowsy and slept. They slept. So when they woke up for the battle, as was the night before the battle, they were all fresh and ready. Because if you were frightened, you would not sleep at night. They would be very weak to fight in the second day. Right? And then Allah tells us about the rain, how he sent the rain, light rain on the Muslim side and heavy rain on the Kafir side. So it made the ground firm for them. And there were brooks that coming down from the mountains. And so they washed themselves as well. They had bath, they did the wudu. So they were very, really fresh. Uh, then Allah tells us about the angels when Allah sent the angels and said, be with the believers, I am with you. Still Allah said to the angels, I'm with you, support the believers. And the Allah said, I'm sending you 1000 angels in successions. And another ayah, they went forward by three, another ayah followed by 5,000. Right. Uh, and then after a few other directions from Allah about uh, the believers and believers, we came to now another uh, uh, rulings regarding the spoils. And that was called Al-Anfal. We said the first ayah, said they ask you concerning the spoils, say it is for Allah and his messenger. Right? So now the Muslim knew that okay, if it's Allah and his messenger, they have no rights to it. Then ayah number 41 says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Wa'alamu anna ma ghanimtum min shay'in fa'anna lillahi qumsahu wa lil-rasooli wa lidhi al-qurba wa lil-yitama wa al-masakeen wa abni al-sabili in kuntum amantum billahi wa ma anzalna ala abdina yawm al-furqan. And take notice that whatever spoils you have gained, then to Allah and his messenger, to the relatives of the messenger, to the orphans, to the needy, needy masakin, plural of miskin, which is different than, slightly different than poor, and wayfarers, fifth of that belongs. If you believe in Allah, and what we have shown to our Abd, Abd means the messenger of Allah, on the day of Furqan, the day of a criterion, when the two parties met, and Allah is capable of everything. So in the first ayah, he says, the spoils belong to Allah and his messenger. Here says, fifth of it belongs to Allah and his messenger. And this fifth to Allah, his messenger, and he mentioned another four categories. The, relative, the relatives of the Prophet, the orphans, the miskeen, and Ibn Sabil. That needs some explanation. Some scholars said, this is Nasikh Ad Mansur. That means the second ayah, where it says only fifth to Allah and his messenger, abrogates the first ayah, where it says all. Others, with a stronger opinion, more prominent scholars say, no, there is no Nasikh Ad Mansur. Both are valid. So when Allah and his messenger takes charge of all the spoils, and when Allah and his messenger takes fifth of it. First of all, when we say Allah and his messenger, let's be clear about that. You see, what does Allah and his messenger mean? They take this, they take decisions. The decision is all Allah's, okay? But we have no direct communication with Allah other than in two ways. The first is the Quran. So whatever in the Quran is what Allah is telling us, telling his messenger and us, and the jinn, and everybody till the day of judgment. So if we dispute anything, did Allah want this? Did Allah say this? Yes, like here's his book, right? So when Muslims dispute, let's say, Muslims among themselves, different sects, okay, let's go back to the Quran. Did Allah say that? Then if it's not there, we look in the Hadith. But the major articles of faith are all in the Quran, right? The Hadith explains some of them, most of them, right? There's no need to explain, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. 
but there is a need to explain how to pray. But the prayer is in the Quran. Right? All the five pillars of Islam are in the Quran. All the six pillars of faith are in the Quran. So when somebody now brings a new idea of a faith and say, but the prophet said it, no. It's got to be in the Quran with the prophet explaining it. So let's see now here. So coming back then, fifth to Allah and his messenger. So I said two ways Allah communicate with us, no third way. And that is either directly from the Quran or indirectly through his messengers. Or whatever the Prophet says, he is guided by, by Allah. He doesn't speak of his own wishes. He is, he is a, an inspired one. So we take our instructions from Allah directly or from his messenger who is inspired by Allah, right? So when his messenger decides what to do with the hummus, with the, with, the, with the spoils, that's because Allah wants him to do that. To so understand what Allah and his messenger, because if we left it, the, the spoils to Allah only, then what to do with it? We cannot say to Allah, take it. It's to him before and after, isn't it? I'll give you a good example of that. Next surah we'll do, inshallah, is Surah at tawbah It talks about zakah, right? Zakah is one of the pillars of Islam. You know that. The zakah, Allah did not tell us it is to Allah and to his messengers. He told us then, because he mentioned it, exactly how to spend it. He made eight categories. The poor, the, the needy, the one who works for it, uh, the wayfarers, the ones who are in debt. All right, we'll come to those inshallah soon, next week or the week after. So he explained to us, you understand, the zakah in details. Right? So the messenger of Allah decides every time they make a spoils, whether it is for him to decide to spend it on the state affair, on his family, on himself, that's his uh, privilege to do that, or to give it to others, to give some of it. The second, so that's the first one. The second ayah is, Allah says, when you dis distribute the spoils to his messenger, fifth of it for you, your relatives, the prophet's relatives, why for the prophet's relatives? I'll come back to this after. The prophet's relatives, the orphans, the masakin, which is uh, the needy ones, who have been that's one fifth. The four fifth, 80% of it goes to the fighters. Why the prophet's relatives? They take from the spoils because the prophet's relatives are not allowed to take zakah or charity, okay? So they are special people. It's haram for them to take sadaqah or zakah, right? It's a privilege that Allah gave them, right? So neither the Prophet, so someone went to test the Prophet ﷺ, he brought him a present. The Prophet ﷺ said, what is that? He said, the sadaqah. He said, I don't take sadaqah. So the man came a few days after, not testing him, probably he was honest about it. No, wrong word I used. Then a few days after he came and he gave him present. He said, what's that? What's the category of it? That's what he meant, because the Prophet could see it. He said, this is a present for you. He accepted it, you understand? So here, while the relative mentioned of the Prophet because they are not allowed to take charity or uh, zakah, all right? So, now, let's see how it is distributed. A good example of what happened from the time of Abu Bakr عنه, who became Khalifa till hundreds of years after, right? Till as long as there was Khilafah. 
with the agreement of all scholars of Islam, of the Sunni scholars, where the Shia have got their own financial uh, arrangement, uh, different than us altogether. Uh, without going into their details. So what happened from Abu Bakr's time, till as I said, as long as there's Khilafah, that the fighters, those who attended the war, they take 80% of the spoils, unless it is too major. And then doesn't include land. It's got to be uh, something that you carry with you, something of wealth, something, but not land, right? So they take fourth, fourth because if they took the land, then few people will, will have uh, uh, possessed the whole Muslim world, right? Otherwise, observation of Umar, Coming back, so, Fifth goes to the state, and four fifth goes to the fighters. The fifth that goes to the state, right? They spend it. The Khalifa, the Amir, Rasulullah. Before that, spend it on the welfare of the state. Okay, and that's what happened all the time. So that's why when we studied Islamic history, remember the spoil that were coming fifth only. There were so much that a lot of Muslims became really multimillionaires, right? Because there's few of them in Mecca and Medina and in Arabia uh, compared to the big gains they were making. They were beating empires, right? Much larger than their numbers and much greater. And the spoils were coming almost on a daily basis to Medina. And they used to send it to other towns and cities in the, in the Muslim world at that time that was growing, okay? So this is now, we know how the spoils are distributed, right? So this is the fifth. Now the Shia said this is the fifth is we pay from, instead of the zakah. That's a different thing. What this, this Allah said, uh, uh, spoils is what you take from kafirs. But for the Shia, spoils is what you take from Muslims, from poor Muslims, you give it to rich ma uh, Maulanas. That's the truth about it. <laughs> Honestly, that's what they do. Because then, uh, anyway, they take the fifth. I mean, Right? Anyway, now, okay, he said, Allah says, what you have gained from spoils, this goes to Allah, his messenger, the relatives of the Prophet ﷺ, the orphans, the needy, the wayfarers. If you believe in Allah on the last day, and you have witnessed what, have, what, has, what, what happened on the criterion day, that's the day of, of when the two armies met, and Allah is able to do thing, to things. And Allah says how you met them in the positions that you could not have prearranged it. That the caravan that had all the trade of Mecca were down below you. That means towards the seaside, but because that was to the uh, to the west towards the sea, while Mecca was to the south. That's why the Muslim couldn't find them. They said, and then they found themselves positioned. They just found themselves positioned there. At, two ends of the valley, one end were the Meccans, one end were the Muslims. Allah said, he arranged that meeting. You could not have arranged such thing, right? Then again, some more signs how Allah helped the Muslims. He says, when Allah made you see them in your dream, as dressing the Prophet Sallam, as they were few. And when you met the Kafirs in the battlefield the second day, when you met them, Allah made you look small in their eyes and made them look small in your eyes. Now, to make the kafir small in the Muslims' eyes, it will raise their morals. There's only few in front of us. But the Muslims were 300, <laughs> we were 1,000 plus. What is the advantage of making the kafirs, the, the kafirs see the Muslims fewer, few as well? Advantage is, when the Kafirs arrived, their first reaction was to the battlefield, the Meccans. There were a thousand plus of them, and they, they sent a man called Umayr ibn Wahab, a clever man from Mecca, a warrior, but again, very experienced man. He went on his horse very close to the Muslim camp, but not close enough to be caught. He had a good look at them, and he came back to report to the Meccans. They said to him, what did you see? He said, I saw 
an army of about 300 men, give or take few. That's not a bad estimate, right? When you are from few hundred yards, and they were 313. But what I noticed as well, that they were so determined, although we are superior in numbers, but I can't see any one of them surrendering or getting killed before killing one of us. How can we go back to Mecca? And it was a small town as well at the time, from just slightly larger than Medina. He said, how can we go back now with 300 dead? That means every family will have five or six or even more dead people. My suggestion, let's go back. And the Meccans were about to go back. But then Abu Jahl and few others insisted, no, if we go back, then our prestige will go solo on the eyes of the Arabs. Uh, nobody will respect us. They'll say we, we fled from few of Muhammad's friends. We can't do that. It's very humiliating. So they decided to, to fight. Why? Right? They decided to fight. So Allah does not, did, did not want them as well to run away before the battle started because Allah planned to kill a lot of them. Right? So when they approached the Muslims, they their morals were raised more because they could see them very few. In reality, there are 300 of them. But as soon as the two armies met, it was too late. Suddenly, and that's not in this Torah, but in Surah Ali Imran, Allah said, the Kafirs could see the Muslims as, they, as if they were twice as many. With their own eyes, they can see twice. Everyone see two men in front of him. Or they can see there's much twice the size of their army. Why is that? Well, Allah can make you see whatever he wants you to see. But as well, there's something we have to know and believe in. In the battlefield, if Allah sent the angels to fight with the Muslims, that happened in Badr, and in, on, in every battle, Allah sent the angels. Allah doesn't send them in every battle. But he sent them even in our lifetime. He has sent them quite a few times to Muslims in different parts of the world. Believe me, it happened. What happened? The Kafirs see the angels, but not as an angel, as angels. They see them as human being, fighters, right? And we said the story about how Al Abbas was a big man, was captured by a small Sahabi. And he tied him up and brought him to the Prophet and he said, this is my chair. That means his belonging. And the Al Abbas said, this man, this little one after arrested me, he had two big men with him. The Muslim did not see the angels. He said, Muslim of Allah, I was alone. The Prophet said to him, be quiet. Two honorable angels were helping you, right? Okay, so when they met, they suddenly saw different numbers all together, but it was too late. They couldn't know whether they run or not, they would be killed. Oh, who you believe, I 45, Oh, you believe, if you meet a group or a force in the battlefield, then be steadfast, don't run away. And remember Allah so you may be successful. This remembering Allah in the battlefield, as Allah ordered the Muslim to do, it has become like a source of ammunition. When the Muslims do fighting, they do a lot of zikr while they're fighting. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. This helps a lot. It frightens the Kafirs a lot. It's source of weapon. That's what Allah says. Right? Uh, stand firm and remember Allah. And then next ayah. وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ And obey Allah and his messenger. And do not dispute among yourselves. For if you do, your force will dissipate and you will fail. And be patient for Allah as well, those who are steadfast and patient. We saw in the battle of Uhud where the Prophet was there and the Sahaba that they were, they, the Muslim disputed. And Allah said, because of that dispute, they've lost the war. Of Uhud. And from that time again till the day of judgment, 
every battle the Muslims lost because of dispute amongst them. Every time they lost, there's a dispute. Two reasons the Muslims lose. Either they are disobedient to Allah and his messenger, and they're going and fighting national wars, like what happens between Muslims and non-Muslims, that's what they keep losing all the time. They're not Islamic mujahideen, right? National armies, like more like uh, mercenaries fighting for salaries, right? So either they have no faith, or if they have faith and lose because they dispute. Every battle that the Muslims fought and lost, there was the, one of those two reasons. Without those two reasons, they don't lose regardless of what the enemy has, has there, right? In the battlefield is when shaitan came, when the kafirs were discussing to fight or not to fight, suddenly shaitan himself, the, the big one, Iblis, came to them, but in the shape of an Arabian uh, chieftain, and he said, well, where are you going? We have to fight. This is your opportunity to get rid of Muhammad and his people. I and my tribe are with you. Okay. They are on their way. So while so he just joined them, and then they were happy as well. All they were out, they outnumbered the Muslims, but an extra few hundred or few thousand would be welcome. <laughs> they are on the way. I've got my I've got my people with you, and he came in the shape of an Arab <laughs> that they knew, right? So. When the battle started, he saw Jibreel. He could recognize Jibreel. He saw him before in heaven when he was there. So he saw him. He ran away. He said to him, where are you running? Where are you going? He said, I see what you don't see. And, and he left them alone. And they were so disappointed, right? He said, I fear Allah. I see, what I see, you don't see. And he just ran away, OK? Next ayah. It's all beautiful ayahs. When the hypocrites and those who have disease in their hearts, they say, those people, the Muslims, have been deluded by their religion. See, but whoever puts his trust in Allah, in Allah Almighty and wise, this is happening all the time. That when the Kafirs, who probably uh, more, much more superior to us in numbers, technology, equipment, etc., they always wonder, how can those deluded people fight us back? I mean, 20 years ago, they, nobody ever thought that those few Mujahideen with clashing coats would defeat a superpower. The Soviets still thought, thought that same. They, they, they think just because they're Mujahideen, they're Muslim, they're going to win. Right? But Allah says, no, whoever depends, relies on Allah, and Allah is mighty and wise. Allah says, the worst creature, that's ayah number 21, the worst creatures in the sight of Allah are the disbelievers, for they have no faith. Here, no faith means they, don't, they have no honor, really. Why? It says, every time you make a treaty with them or an agreement, they dishonor it. And they have no righteousness. So if you meet them in the battlefield, Make sure that you make an example of them to their supply lines. This is all great eyes, really. It's all, subhanAllah. Allah says, you don't only strike them hard to defeat them. You should give a message by defeating them that they will never think of coming back. Or even if they have people who are coming to help them, they will say, no, no, we better not face these people. I remember in 19. 70, uh, no, 88, 89, when the Soviets were, were drawing, people thought that they'll come back. One Mujahideen leader said, they will never come back. They were beaten badly. The Americans now again saying, we will never come back. Right? Because if you hit them so hard, so they, the ones behind them will be so frightened that they will not come anywhere near. See, see, so you see how Allah plans the wars, right? We can, people cannot do this. You can't arrange it, really. If you fear treachery from people or from other nations or people that you have agreement with, straight away, if you have an agreement with them, 
if they dishonor it, you say my, the agreement is broken. If you don't honor the agreement, we will not honor it as well. Because to honor it from one side is a sign of weakness where the enemy will exploit. Right? Allah says in ayah number 60, وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَا سَطَعْتُمْ مَنْ قُوَّةٌ وَمَنْ رِبَاطَ الْخَيْلِ تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَعَدُوَكُمْ وَآخَرِينَ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَهُمْ اللَّهُ يَعْلَمُهُمْ وَمَا تُنْفِقُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تُظْلَمُونَ And prepare for them whatever means of strength you can afford. He did not say prepare to them like their preparedness. We cannot prepare atomic weapons. We cannot prepare F-35s or F-18 or any Fs. We can. But uh, prepare whatever you can. And the rest will come from Allah. But Allah says as well, many people think that whatever you can means zikr and reading Quran. He says, no. Power. Prepare for them whatever power you want. And just in case somebody misunderstood that, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said, Power means shooting. He repeats three times. Power means shooting. Power means shooting. Prepare whatever you can. Okay? Not whatever they can. Then we cannot fight them. Simple as this. He says, as well as uh, horses. Prepare your horses. The horses were the best means of fighting at the time. Just like in our life, in our time now, the Air Force, etc. Those who had horses, they always had much more advantage over uh, footmen, right? And because of that, the Muslims at Badr had two horses. At the battle, 10 years after the, the Battle of Yarmouk, they had 6,000 horses, okay? Within 10 years, it's a big difference, right? If the enemy defers to peace, number 61, if they defer to peace or inclined to peace, then you defer to peace as well. But that is not an occupying enemy. That is not an enemy that who took your rights or your land. A neighboring enemy, an enemy that you're fighting even at a distance, but they seek help, they seek peace, as long as they don't break it then seek peace, because we're not there to kill people and force them to become Muslims, right? If they defer or incline towards peace, you incline towards peace as well, and put trust in, your, in Allah. But if they defer to for peace to, uh, to deceive you, because they do this next ayah uh, says, then sufficient for you is Allah with you. For he, Allah, is the one who gave you support with his victory and by giving you those believers. Allah gave him the best believers in the history of mankind to him. And he made the believers' hearts close to each other. Believers love each other. Oh, Muhammad, if you spend the wealth of the earth to make people's hearts close to each other, you cannot do that. But Allah arranged that, for he is mighty and wise. That's why Muslims love each other throughout the history, even in our lifetime, even we have differences, unless it is major in faith and aqeedah, but like what we have between us and the Shia, like the Qadian, etc. If, and this is a sign, who are the believers? All the Muslims throughout the world are happy because of what happened in Afghanistan, what happy when the Hamas wins, or are happy when, when they are sorry for what's happening in Kashmir, in China, this why because we love our muslims whether in china or in america this love why you will not find a christian european loves the christian african true we give them christianity and they give them another separate church right yeah. yes. but, but who could arrange this right only allah right this is something funny that i've noticed that the arab christians when they come to europe they think that the Europeans will give them special treatment because they say religion. And actually, they have more disrespect for them than they have for the Muslims. Right? <laughs> and they get so disappointed. I'm telling you, right? Yes, isn't it? But, but when we see... Um, oh, 
messenger of Allah, encourage Muslims to fight. For if there are 20 patient ones amongst you, they can beat 100 of the Kafirs because they don't understand. That means one to 10. If there's 20, they can be 200. But then Allah says, this is now Nasikh al Mansukh, abrogated. Next ayah. Allah has made things lighter for you. He knows that you've got weaknesses. That means we're not all as good as the people of Badr. If there are 100 amongst you, they can be 200. If there are 1,000, they can be 2,000. So Allah expects us the minimum to do is to beat one to two, right? It's all just Muslim feel, you got to feel that, that their numbers, at least if they're twice as many, we can beat them. If more, then we need Allah's help more as well, okay? In the Battle of Badr, they captured many, as I said, they killed 70 of the Kafirs and captured 70, right? So now it's the first time that the Muslims captured uh, uh, Kafirs. What to do with them? So the Prophet asked the Sahaba. Abu Bakr said, they are our relatives. They are still relatives of Mecca. So if we take ransom for them, it will weaken them financially. It will increase our strength. Uh, Omar, what do you think? Omar said, it's the first battle to give them a good lesson. I think we we'll chop their heads off. <laughs> then the prophet took Abu Bakr's advice. The second day, and then they decided not to kill them, but to take ransom for them. The second day, Omar, woke up from the, in the camp and he was walking and he saw the Prophet and Abu Bakr crying. He said, why are you crying? Tell me so I can join you crying. He said, Allah was about to punish us for taking ransom. You were right, we should have killed him. Right? So Umar was right there, Allah agreed with him, right? But Allah says, because there's somewhere else in the Quran, Allah mentioned that you can't take ransom because of that, Allah will not punish you for the wrong decision. Okay. Then consume what you have gained. It's legitimate and wholesome and remain conscious of Allah after Allah is forgiving and merciful. Right? Now, one of the captives was Al Abbas, the Prophet's uncle. He was a rich man. So he got to be a higher ransom. He said, Messenger of Allah, I'm a believer. But I was forced to come. If, they, if I didn't come, they would have killed me. They would have known that I'm Muslim. Because the Muslims who were left back in Mecca after the immigration, they couldn't declare their Islam like before. They would have killed them. Or they would have taken their properties. Or it depends on their status. But at least they would have given them a much harder time. Now the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar and Major Sahaba have left. So the Muslims who were in Mecca, they kept their Islam secret. So Al Abbas said, I am uh, I'm a Muslim, so I can't be taken as captives. So the Prophet kept him as captive. And Allah revealed this. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, till inform the prisoners that you have got hold of. If what they say is the truth, Allah knows what's in their hearts. But as the Prophet said, the Prophet said to them, We'll treat you as one of them. We can't treat you different way. We saw you in the enemy camp, we'll treat you as an enemy. So Allah says, Allah knows what's in your heart. If you're telling the truth, Allah will substitute you, substitute you better, than what, better than what has been taken from you or what will be taken from you, and he will forgive you. But if you want to betray Allah and his messenger, then you have done that before, and Allah overpowered you, right? So again, there's no deceit there. Why? Allah knows. You could say to the Prophet, yes, he's a believer. But Allah is making a rule for the future, for the Muslims. We cannot just capture somebody and says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah and I am praying, etc. Right? Like, how do we know? We catch, do you understand the, the wisdom behind it? Even the Prophet's uncle, Allah did not spare him. Right? He spared his life, but he had to be, be treated like a kafir. As the Prophet said, we catch you in the, in the enemy camp, we treat you like an enemy. So one Muslim now captured a kafir and says, oh, la ilaha Allah. After you captured him, if you say it, you treat him like a kafir. 
we don't know what's in his heart, that's between him and Allah. The last three ayahs about the believers now. Those who have believed in the Amanu, Wahajaru, and they immigrated and they struggled, did the jihad fi sabillah with their wealth and their on themselves. Always jihad comes with your wealth and with yourselves, with your body. Without wealth, without money, you cannot fight. There's no free weapons, no free food, right? All of the jihad with yourself and with your welfare and with yourselves. Those who did, they, they became believers and did the hijra and they did jihad with their wealth and with themselves or their possessions with themselves. And those who gave them support and nusra, I mean ansar, that means the people of Medina, muhajirin and ansar, those are the allies and brothers and friends of each other. Right? So the Muhajirin and the Ansar, those who did jihad, those who did the hijra, these are the allies of one another. But those who became believers and did not do the hijra, you, they are not your allies. He didn't say not your brothers, not your allies. So we cannot, you cannot ally yourselves with that. Why? Because that caused a lot of problems for Muslims. Right, unless they make the hijra, then they become part of your system. Right, in case they ask for help, the believers who are a minority, right? Let's say the Muslims in China now they're seeking help, the Muslims in India they're seeking help, right? Can we help them or not as a state, not as individuals? As individuals, is another case, not the time to talk about it. But as a state now we're talking about, as an institute, as, as an establishment. If the Muslims, the minority Muslims in one quarter ask for help because they are persecuted, like the Meccans were in Mecca during the Prophet time, the Meccans were left behind, the Muslims. He says, you, you cannot give them alliance unless they make the hijra. But if they seek help from you, then help them except if there is agreement between you and those kafirs who are ruling them, right? That's how Muslims uh, honor international laws, right? Understand? This is very clear. If mm. there is agreement between you and another country, peace, trade, etc., there's no war between you and another country, you cannot even help the Muslims who are there. You could help them morally, you could talk to the other people, Okay, but this is very clear. Allah is very practical in its advice. Next one. But the kafirs are allies of one another. If you don't do the same, there will be fitna and big corruption. Fitna, we said, big problems for Muslims in their faith, physically, right? Corruption means corruption, all sorts of corruptions. So Allah says, if you don't become allies of one another, you will cause big fitna for the Muslims because the kafirs are allies of each other. We can see this. The kafirs always, when it comes to Islam, they are always against, they are not against Muslims. Throughout the history, we've done the Islamic history, the kafirs support each other. The Christians supported the Mughals when they attacked the Muslim world. The Shia supported the Christians before and now. This is, we cannot, this is the truth. The, the kafirs support each other, and Allah said, if you don't support each other, that there'll be big fitna. That means you lose a lot of people. A lot of people will, be, will leave Islam. A lot of Muslims will be killed. Last two ayahs. For those who have believed, and they did hijrah, and did jihad fi sabillah, and those who have given them shelter, as the Ansar of Medina, they are the true believers. For them, there will be forgiveness and a lot of provisions from Allah. So Allah is praising again the Muhajireen and Ansar, those who did Hijrah and Jihad, and those who gave them uh, shelter, the uh, Ansar, they are the true believers. Now this is the words of Allah. Anyone called Muhajireen and Ansar Kafirs or Munafiq, he is a Kafir and Munafiq himself. This is very serious ayah about the Muhajirin and Ansar, because there are Muslims 
unfortunately, or call themselves Muslims who criticize the Ansar al-Hajri. They're not infallible, but they are the true believers. It is a testimony from Allah. They are They are the true believers that Allah will forgive them. Why Allah will forgive them? Because they will make mistakes. They will make sins, a human, right? They're not angels, right? So we can never criticize the Muhajireen and Ansar unless we want to be kafirs or Munafiks, right? What's about those who became believers after? That's next ayah. For those who believe after that and did the hijrah, that's not the early Muhajireen, because another ayah says the, the early Muhajireen, and those who did jihad, they are one view as well, right? They are one view as well. So, because many Muslims, after the conquest of Mecca, there was no more hijrah, right? But there was jihad, the battle of Hunayn, the battle of uh, Tabuk, right? And then the conquest that Muslims did throughout the world, said so those who ever did after that and join you in your, in your jihad, they, they belong to you. So as not to limit the number of believers only to the first two, three thousand Muhajireen and Ansar, right? And then, so this is as far as Muhajireen and Ansar. But then Allah says as well, reminding us, arhami awla bi fi kitabillah. As Allah reminding us, and those arham, you know, remember rahim, womb, those relatives, relatives are supporters and allies of each other. That is in the book of Allah. In other words, don't say just only the Muslims, uh, the, the Ansar and Mujahideen, the Ansar and Muhajireen, only the allies. And if you are a good believer, you are my friend, only you are my friend and my brother. But I still, you still have to look after your relatives, right? Because you are responsible for him. That is in the book of Allah, for Allah is aware of everything. This is the end of Surah Al-Anfal. قولوا قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.